I believe, after all those dramas, we are now live. So hopefully we've got some people that have waited the, the 50 minutes uh, that we were delayed there uh, due to technology. Um, if there is anyone tuned in live already, if you could let us know, if you can see and hear us, that would be incredibly appreciated. Um, technology is not my thing, so that's why we don't put it anywhere near. We hand on to other people to take care of, but things still go wrong. So um, apologies that we are 50 minutes late in starting, but hopefully everything's coming through loud and clear now. So fingers crossed. You <laughs> can see we are live. There we go. It's came up. We've got 20 people watching. Fantastic. Hello, everyone at home, and apologies that we are so late in starting. Like we said, technology. What can you do? It's great when it works. <laughs> <laughs> so I think so we're 15 minutes late. I think we might as well dive straight in. Um, we've got a few people saying hello. We've got uh, Samantha saying it's working great. We've got John saying cheers. Steve saying it's okay now. Wonderful. Now we, can all, we can all relax, guys. We're, we're fine. Yeah. <laughs> going onwards. Um, so I'll kick things off. Um, so hi, welcome. Um, my name is Gary Ross. I am the brand ambassador here at the Jewers Aberfilly Distillery. And I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for another Facebook Live, live from the home of Jewers, Jewers Aberfilly Distillery. Um, and this evening, we're talking about something that's a little bit special. It's a very special year for us at the company because this is our 175th anniversary, which is incredible. Um, and I've got a couple of ringers in today, some people that are new to our Facebook Lives, but some absolute pros from our company that the company basically wouldn't exist without. Uh, first of all, we've got our archivist, the amazing Jackie Sargent. Jackie, thank you so much for, for giving up your evening to join me on Facebook this evening. I hope you're doing well. I'm good, thank you very much. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first FaceTime Live, so very exciting. Excellent, excellent. And we also have Rianne. So Rianne is our assistant blender. Rianne, thank you so much as well for giving up your evening. Uh, it's always good having people from the blend team. We can try and pick your brain for some, uh, some little secrets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. And as well, again, guys, everyone at home, thank you very much for, for tuning in and putting up with the, the delay we had there. Um, I believe it's because of the weather, but, you know, it's Scotland. The weather's never good anyway, so you just got to muddle through with, with whatever you can. And um, as a thank you to you guys for putting up with that 15-minute late start, right. and, of course, for uh, first of all, we've watching our archivist, our usual face, Jackie, Jackie Sargent. Jackie, thank you so much again. for um, giving up your so evening to join me on Facebook evening. I hope you're doing well. I'm good, thank you very much. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first FaceTime live, so very exciting. So, guys, I think without... Any further ado, we should probably get first of all, I'll be watching our archivist. Our usual yeah, face yeah, it's good. <laughs> so we did have um, some sample packs went out. I think we saw quite a few of them. So hopefully there's a few of those people at home tuned in live. Um, if you do have a pack, it'd be great to hear your thoughts, your tasting notes. Um, or if you have any of these bottles at home, if not, let us know what you're enjoying a dram of. Um, it's always good to know which of the fantastic Dewar's range of our, our malt whiskies you're enjoying. And um, other brands are, of course, available. But uh, <laughs> I think this is a place for a certain uh, range of whiskies. Um, but this evening, we're going to start something off, uh, start off with something that's a little bit different. Um, so like we said, this Facebook Live, really, it's all to celebrate our kind of legacy, 175 years of Dewar's, which is just incredible. Um, but, you know, we're not this kind of stuffy, old fashioned kind of boring whiskey company that's just been doing the same thing for 175 years. We're still innovating. We're still trying new things and creating new products and just kind of seeing what will and won't work with, with whiskey and pushing the, the boundaries out. Uh, and I think this first whiskey is a great example of that. It's our Illegal Smooth, part of our eight year old uh, cask series range. And it's actually the first Scotch whiskey to be finished in Mezcal casks. So Jackie, Rihanna, I know we're chatting before we started this, both big fans of Mezcal, aren't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. I'd say it's definitely my top 20 at least. <laughs> top 20 at least, excellent. So for, for anyone that doesn't know what Mezcal is, it's very similar tequila to tequila, but it's kind of smoky. It's got this very kind of smoky edge to it. Um, personally, I'm not a big fan of, of Mezcal, but this whiskey is just something completely different. So it is the next series, in, next in our eight-year-old cask series. So basically, it's a range you do with Dewar's, where it's a, an eight-year-old blend. It's the same recipe we start off with, and we finish it for however long it kind of needs. Um, it's kind of an undetermined amount of time in a different type of cask um, for a period of time to impart a different flavor. 
And it's all really to do with this kind of exploring flavor and cultures through whiskey. You know, will this and this work? Maybe not, but let's see what comes out. Uh, so there's four whiskies in the range now. The first one was our Caribbean Smooth, obviously finished in rum casks. This one was actually the second release in that series, but it's only been released in the UK for, oh, I want to say about a month and a half now, something like that. It's been in the US for about a year and a half, but quite new in the UK. Um, we then have our Portuguese Smooth, finished obviously in port casks. And the newest edition that came out literally about two weeks ago now is our Japanese Smooth, finished for three months in Mizunara uh, oak cask from Japan. Um, but Rianne, would you be able to tell us anything about this? So the, the finishing period, obviously, we say is different for all of these because obviously a different cast imparts flavour in different ways and at different rates and things, I guess. Uh, can you tell us anything about the finishing is in these casks? Yeah, so like you said, Mezcal is just a bit different from any I've ever worked with before. So I know certainly, and, and because no one else in the industry has kind of done it before, we, we didn't really know what was going to happen. Do you know, like you said, is it going to work? Um, how long is it going to take? So with the D8 series, we have to be really careful, do you know, and we constantly sample it. So it actually got down to the Mezcal we were sampling every week just to see, like, is it okay or, because you don't want it to go too far, and then it's how do you kind of bring it back the way. Um, so yeah, yeah, the, the mezcal's different. Like you said, it's the same base that goes into them, but I feel like a lot of the other D8 series have got like a really sweet note to them, whereas this one just goes a completely different way. And just, you know, that smoky note is really predominant. Like you said, it comes from the mezcal. So it's still got the classic Tours notes, you know, like the sweetness and the honey, but that smoky note really, really comes through, which which makes it different and makes it really exciting. It, it definitely is. I think, you know, it, it's, I'm a big fan of the, the Tours each year. It's also going to come across bias working for the company and talk about these whiskies day in, day out. But even within our portfolio of what we do, I'm a big fan of the series because it's a great way of just exploring flavour. You know, most um whiskies have got a weird or wonderful finish they're going to sell for you know sometimes hundreds of pounds you know for example our japanese smooth that's just been released mizunara oak or mizunara casks are incredibly expensive and usually any release is going to cost you hundreds and hundreds of pounds but this series is really all about exploring flavors and, and cultures and they're very affordable i mean the whole range are 28 pounds a bottle and because it's yeah. the same base blend you're really exploring what that type of cask or that type of oak is really imparting onto the, the character of what's already there. Yeah, exactly. That, I think that's the, the basis of the whole D8 series is, you know, it's to showcase other cultures, other spirits and stuff that are out in the world. And I really, I think it, it really does it well here. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, like the herbal notes that come through, like it's really herbaceous and to you know, the grassy notes and stuff that you don't particularly see in things like Cane Smooth or with Portuguese Smooth where you get the fruity orchard notes. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's really good. It's Yeah, it's just it's so different, which I think is why people are reacting really well to it and really enjoy it. Yeah. I love the kind of strange... I mean, tequila to me, or mezcal as well, it's got this classic kind of bell pepper, like green pepper kind of note. It's not, you know, a spicy chili. It's that kind of green pepper kind of vegetable character. And you really just pick mm -hmm. it up. And with whiskey, you're like, do I like that? I don't know. I think I do. And then you try it and you absolutely love it. It's so different to anything you'll have had before. Jack, yeah, I think, so. I think oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think in general, mezcal is like a marmite. You love it or hate it. So... This is a, a way to, well, you might not be a Mezcal fan. If you're a whiskey fan, you, you'll like it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think, we... it's lo I think it's lovely, actually, yeah. I had never tried it before, and I've never tried Mezcal either, so I'm not entirely sure I know <laughs> what the influence is, but I get that it's quite smoky, and there's a dryness to it as well. Um, but I, I really quite like it, although it's unusual for a Dewar's blend, definitely. It makes yeah, it slightly yeah. unusual. I think, you know, it's, it's the good thing about the series and it's kind of like you're saying, man, that the, the, the length of finish, you don't know what it's going to be because it's all about finding that balance. I mean, you could very easy take a blend, chuck it in a cask, leave it for how many years and what you get out is what you get out. But you don't want to mask the effort that's been put in creating that blend and the, the carrots that's picked up from those eight years of maturation. So, yes, you can pick up all the kind of notes from mezcal or kind of what it's imparted, but 
you can still tell it's Scotch whiskey. You can still tell kind of the cast that have gone into it. And it's got the, all the hallmarks of a Jewish blend, which I think is brilliant. Mm-hmm. I think it's a real testament to what you guys are doing in the blend team just now. It's, you know, a lot of our whiskies that we're releasing have these finishes, but it's to complement. It's not to dominate what's yeah. already there. And I think that's the key. You know, that's that skill. If you chuck it in and it just tastes of what you finished it in, there's not really any skill involved <laughs> in that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what kind of makes part of our job exciting and interesting is, you know, we don't know the answer. Like if, if you said a finish, every finish was months, you know, put it in a cast, take it out. We're this weird, you know, every day we're excited to see what's it going to be like. And we look back to our notes. You know, we've all got a notebook that we take the blend to look at where last time compared to now. So yeah, it makes my job exciting having stuff like this. It sounds like a great job. If you need a hand, just let me know. I'm more than happy to get a notebook and <laughs> can come and lend a nose. <laughs> <laughs> anytime <laughs> we've got a comment from Barry there saying the spice and the pepper really complements the honey of Jews and I think that's what it is it's that balance because mezcal it's very it's quite an in your face kind of spirit I guess is probably the best way of putting it um, mm-hmm. so I guess finding that balance could have been quite a challenge but I think you guys have really hit it on the nose and I think you said it's only a month to two month finish that we're looking at for this one so it is a, a short amount of time but that's all it needed yeah it's, it's quick quick so like I said we had to get down to you know basically checking it every week because yeah we don't want it to go too far um because as you said it could be it was a really long mezcal finish I'm not sure that would be as enjoyable but um yeah it's, it's good so Rianne obviously being the, the assistant blender it must be so exciting being on the blend team at the moment with all the the kind of innovation that jurors are doing you know through the double double series the, the cast series have got and of course our, our single malts I imagine every day is incredibly different, <laughs> but can you give us kind of an idea of kind of what it entails being a blender? Yeah, of course. So yeah, like you said, every day is different. Every day I walk in and my day starts differently, but in general, we try to do um, our nosing kind of in the morning. So it usually means that I have to give my morning coffee, which is not the greatest um but yeah luckily enough we've got Kirsty in our sample room she tends to put out our samples um every morning for us so it'll be things like the new makes or um any of the samples that have been batted to come through just just for approval so mm-hmm. it's a bit of that um it could be up nose and casts uh, we check we QC all the casts then so whether it's our sherry bots um any special casts wine casts like that come in um Funnily enough, you said about Japanese smooth. Part of my job, actually, I went to the Japanese cast be off loading um, because they're so expensive. We were so careful with them. So I got to go and see them um, be loaded. Um, but then the other part of it is, you know, it's a lot of time at your desk looking at stock models and looking at the stocks because the way I see our job is that we are the guardians of the stock. And if we could say the brand teams always come to us with, with ideas of what they want to do and we if we said yes to all of them then 10 50 50 years in the future we would have nothing left so it kind of feels like you're the bad cop sometimes if you're no we can't do that no we can't do that uh, but yeah it's we're trying to keep an our foot in the present we we'll do but look to the future to make sure that we're doing the best for for jurors so that we keep expanding and doing more series or doing different things so yeah every day is different it's never dull it's never dull. Yeah, definitely I think I think it's the same for everyone that works in the whiskey there's no no such thing as two days being the same and there's no thing as a dull day I think uh, at all um yeah. yeah we've got we've got a few comments we've got um someone asking why is it illegal um so illegal is the name of the the brand of the distillery that these mezcal casks have came from so it's illegal mezcal that we've taken the cash from, and that's what we've we've then finished in. Um, we've got Jim's asking if there's any whiskey tasting checking jobs going, Rianne. Any space? In the- <laughs> <laughs> I'll see. I'll see. Yeah. I'll see. I, think, I think there'll be a lot of competition for those jobs, Jim. To be honest, <laughs> it's very high demand. <laughs> but I think you know it, it's it's great getting these insights into you know what's happening at our, our offices down in Glasgow from the blend team and seeing all the weird and wonderful and fantastic innovation that's coming out just now, specifically from Jewers with the, the cast crews that we're, we're talking about at the moment. 
Uh, and I think it's a real testament to Jewish. You know, we've been around for 175 years, but we're not dull, old fashioned in the same thing we've always been doing. You know, I think Rand was saying, you know, no day is, is dull at, at Jewish. And uh, as a very smooth transition, uh, Jackie, dull, that's where our founder John Jewell <laughs> from it's almost like I've, I've got used to that transition wow. before isn't it <laughs> um, obviously as kind of managing the archive and the, the story of, of John Dewar and Sons there's a lot of stuff to talk about um, I don't suppose you could give us kind of a potted history in kind of three or four minutes of the last 175 years <laughs> That's at all possible. No pressure. <laughs> I can do no my best. Pressure, yeah. Yeah, I'll probably normally take about an hour over the history. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting what um, Rianne uh, Rian was saying, because I think we have a similar focus in that we're, um, we're trying to think about what's happening today in the business, but we're also looking to the future as well, because mm-hmm. we're looking to gather the, the, what's going to be interesting to the future history. And like the bottle of Illegal is in our archive now. We're, we're not just collecting in things in our collection that are 100 years old or 50 years old. It, what we're doing the business today is just as important as what we did 175 years ago. Um, and that's something that's recognized by the company. We've even just built a new bottle archive because we've got so many new products coming out and we needed more space to be gathering for. So it's an exciting time to be working at Jewers. Um, but, you know, if we go back in time, if we go back 175 years when it all started, um, John opened his shop in 1846 uh, on Perth High Street. And he was a wine and spirits dealer to start off with. Um, he had his shop, he was selling all types of different products. He would be selling Scotch whiskey and like rum and champagne and wine and beer and, and everything you could imagine. Um, and when blending started to kick off in about the 1860s, um, then he was at the forefront of that. He was one of the early pioneers of created blended Scotch whiskey. And that is what really kind of what put the industry on the map. I know, I know things, single malts existed historically and right into the, you know, right the way through history. Um, but it was with the blending that it became more popular and more widespread um, throughout the Scotland and the world. So John Deere had this fabulous thriving business throughout Scotland with his own blended whiskies that were labeled John Dewar's blends, selling them throughout hotels and bars and everywhere. Um, but his, his his company was very much based in Scotland and based at the shop in Perth. So it was quite small scale in many ways. Um, and it was really when he died and he passed um, the company on to his sons that it really took off on the global level and really became the thing that we know today. So these are kind of the little foundation stones that we can still see in the company today. Um, so when he died in 1880, he handed the business over to John Alexander Dewar, who was um, his second eldest son. Um, and he was really good at the business. He was like his dad. Everyone called him a, a chip off the old block. Um, so he was brilliant at, at looking after the business, at, at blending um, and at growing the company. Um, and he brought in his youngest brother, Tommy, uh, Tommy Dewar, into the business with him. And between them, they did a phenomenal job of creating the global foundation. So Tommy was the natural kind of marketing sales guy. He set off on a two-year world sales tour around the world, uh, went to 26 countries, appointed 32 agents to sell our products. Meanwhile, John, back in Scotland, was having to make sure he could get the infrastructure down to meet the demand that was being created. So it was a bit of a a kind of a a, a dual job there going on between them. Um, And... You know, they did an amazing job. By the early 1900s, Jews was the most exported Scotch whiskey um, in the world. So, and that is the foundation we're building off today. You know, it was, they founded us in America, which we became number one in America. Um, we had markets in India, in Sydney, Australia, all around the world. Um, and so it's, it's really nice to kind of, to kind of see how we've built on, on this foundation. It is like a bit of living history. It isn't just about stuff that happened a long time ago. It's no longer important. It's really important to where we are today, I think. And one of the things that Tommy did, um, so the big personality in the brand, he entered us in competitions to try and make sure we had independent endorsements uh, that would say that our whiskey was really good quality. Um, and so we won lots of awards. The very first was 1886. I've got the first one with me. So I've got some show and tell things. I'm always doing. I'm always sharing things from the archive. <laughs> when, show and tell is fantastic. I love show and tell. There we go. It's kind of lovely. And the old awards are beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. There's that. So this is from the Edinburgh International Exhibition in 1886. 
We won a silver, absolutely beautiful. Um, and we've won more than a thousand awards since then. So we are the most award blended Scotch whiskey, uh, which is um, phenomenal. And it all started with Tommy Dewar. And it really, his goal was to get our whiskey well known because historically there was an awful lot of rough whiskey around and you really did need to get your name known to let people and the customers trust your product. You didn't have to mature your whiskey back in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. Uh, you could just sell it straight from a pot still, never seen a cask in its life and you would still be calling it Scotch whiskey. Whereas obviously today, we have to mature it for three years to call it Scotch whiskey. And the cask has a massive impact on the final product. So you can imagine the bit of the, the wild, wild west it was in the whiskey industry yeah, back in the day. So those awards were fundamental. Um, and the next thing really that was happening was the creation of the portfolio. So when you think that we, we have white label today, we have lots of other products like Illegal Mezcal, the Portuguese Smooth, Caribbean Smooth. We had a big portfolio historically as well. That's not a new phenomenon. And it was similar in that it was partly about experimentation and innovation, partly about different whiskies for different price points, different ages of whiskey. So it was quite sophisticated. I don't, I don't think we should ever um, assume that things were a bit backward, um, you know, 100 years ago or 150 years ago. They, were, they knew what they were doing. Um, that's how we're still around today. <laughs> <laughs> Very good foundation. So Jewish White Label is um, a product that has been around since the, like the early days. It was, it was created around about 1899 by our first official master blender. And we say that because before that it was John Dewar did the blending, his son John Ale Alexander did the blending, and then A.J. Cameron took it on. That was like really when the family was starting to do more of a high level management job and leave all the other work to, to everyone else. So A.J. Cameron was a phenomenal blender, very well renowned in the industry. And he created White Label, and then it's been the next seven generations uh, of our, our master blenders who have uh, taken on that mantle uh, and recreated White Label year after year with the, the, the claim it never varies. You know, that's quite a, a feat for anybody. It's probably a feat from batch to batch, never mind from decade to decade, um, yeah. because, you know, distilleries close down and you, then blenders have to find a new replacement for different parts of the recipe. Um, whiskies have changed massively through history, but the production processes have changed. And although obviously it's still whiskey, and I'm sure we'd recognize whiskey as whiskey like a hundred years ago, uh, but they would have been heavier, they would have been smokier just because of the, the way the production processes were. It's, it's um, amazing how you know different the industry is, you know, compared now to 175 years ago. Like you're saying, you didn't have to age whiskey back then to call it whiskey. And I'm sure quite a lot of people watching at home have probably visited us at the distillery and done a tour with us. If you go into a warehouse, we've got 40 casks all painted with different names and different colours and things. They were all used at one point in Jewish white label, but 70% of them don't actually exist as distilleries anymore. I think it's a real testament to the skill of the, the master blender. And like Rianne was saying, you know, they're almost just custodians of that stock, that inventory. They're going to decide what's going into the current batches and what's going to potentially go in in 10 years, 20 years time. Yeah. A lot of the time you're never going to see that some of the stuff that you're, you're laying down, I guess. It's... Uh, yeah, exactly. Learning. Exactly. It's interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting, actually, when I was looking at the, the kind of profile of our early blenders as, as specifically. So say John Alexander Jewett inherited the business from his dad in 1880. He was 24 years old. He's inherited the family business and he's the blender at that time. I mean, that's incredible, isn't it? I think that actually should be inspirational that if you've got the skill and the knowledge, which he had, because it was his family business, he's obviously been brought up knowing all about whiskey. Um, and he obviously had a really good nose. Um, you know, you can do anything. And then AJ Cameron invented White Label right about the time he was 30. So, you know, these were young, really young people. And now it's fantastic, actually, on top of that, it's fantastic to see women taking on this role as well, because historically it was men that did the blending. Um, and then Stephanie's become our very first female master blender in our history. And now Rianne's joined the team. Uh, it's actually nice to get that, that diversity coming through. Definitely, definitely. And of course, we've just got to mention as much as we can, but Stephanie recently named for the third year in a row master blender of the year. It's just absolutely unbelievable. Um, I see we've got a few people telling us um, from where in the world they are. Um, some from not too far away. We've got Charlene, and I suppose Stuart will be there as well from Clack Manningshire. We've got Barry from Port Ellen on Isla. So quite a lot of fairly local nice. people, but um, a few from, from further afield. But it's incredible how well-traveled Tommy was for his day. You know, the early 1890s, he literally did two globe-trotting adventures. You know, went around the world twice. The first to sell whiskey, the second just because he had a cold, I believe. 
well, <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> he did a few world tours. Yeah, and he, yeah, he was a big character. He liked, he just loved to travel. He loved to explore other nationalities and other countries. It was a part of his passion, definitely. Very much larger than life. And what better of an ambassador to kind of take your whiskies all around the world. And I always like to think largely because of this new export market that he just created, the demand for jurors just increased so much and the brothers had to then look to build a distillery. So obviously they did own a distillery nearby here, um, Ochnagi, in a place called Tully Met, so just about roughly 10 miles from where Aberfeld is today. Um, Show you a label for that. I've got one with me. Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> what a link there. I know that wasn't even planned. <laughs> I was looking through. I'm going to get the, I'm getting the gloves on. <laughs> this is the... Getting the gloves. Like I was saying, Jackie, the, the custodian for now. Someone else could look at it in the future. Do you know we want? Yeah, we want this this collection to last a really long, like hundreds of years in the future. We don't. So really, we ha it's a legacy. We we don't own it. We just care for it. It's very similar to what Rianne's doing. This is one of our old label books, one of the little ones. These were like all the main officers would have had these with the samples of what our labels looked like. Um, probably partly so that they could see if there were counterfeits in the local area. Um, so we have. Really beautiful label. It, I think it is Victorian as well. So it's early, it's 1890s. So beautiful, isn't it? Wow. It's absolutely beautiful, yeah. Really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's um, so yeah, we own that. Well, we leased that distillery from the 18 uh, from 1890 to 1910 when we closed it down. It just it wasn't practical to keep that one open, unfortunately. But yeah, we built a felt distillery. Yeah. Just wasn't <laughs> big enough. <laughs> well, it wasn't big enough. It wasn't easy to improve the situation, whereas Aberfeldy was in the perfect location. So, you know, it was that the railway line that went to Perth. Exactly. So it was perfect. And obviously, they could, they could basically set up the production however they wanted. So it was 1896, they made the decision to purpose build a distillery here at Aberfeldy, intent on making a light, sweet, fruity whiskey to use as the base of the blends. They broke ground in 1897. First spread came off our stills towards the end of 1898, and it's always been used as the heart malt for the Jewish blends ever since. And it's only, I guess, relatively recently. I mean, you, you could get it kind of here and there in the 90s and things, but it's only really in the last 20 or so years that you'd, you'd see it. And even within that, it's the last six or seven years, but it's got quite a bit more, more visibility to it. And there's so many fantastic expressions of Aberfeldy. And it's this point I should probably mention, being from Aberfeldy, Everything I say about Aberfeldy will always be incredibly biased. Um, <laughs> but for me, some of the finest examples you're going to get, it's always the distillery fill your owns. So we'll, we always have two. Um, it used to be one would be bourbon, one would be sherry. Whereas currently we've got one that's bourbon and one that is our fantastic Aberfeldy 40-year-old. So if you're feeling uh, like you want to treat yourself, you can come on site and fill your own bottle of Aberfeldy 40-year-old. And um, we've not included that in the tasting pack, though. Um, we've, we've included <laughs> the other one, the shop sale, Phil. Um, so the cask that's sitting in the whiskey lounge in our visitor centre. So we've literally just got this one. I think we got put in over the weekend. Um, we, we put into that cask. Um, so it's a 2002 vintage from a first filled barrel, I believe you said, Rianne. You checked the, the it was, yeah, first filled bourbon, check before it came on. And it's 52% alcohol. So it is cast strength, it is natural colour, all the rest that goes with that. And it's a fantastic expression of, of Aberfeldy. To me, if you really want to understand a distillery and, and what they're doing, really you're looking at using bourbon barrels because when you put bourbon in a cask, it's, it's not flavourless. There's not a lot of character there. So when you enjoy bourbon, really you're enjoying what the wood has imparted. And because the bourbon stripped out a lot of that kind of upfront flavour, the tannins, we're then using it in Scotland, it's more mellow maturation. And it really just lets the style of the distillery sing. Um, I think Aberfeldy, usually kind of 17 to 20 years old in this type of cask, that is just the absolute sweet spot. And this one is no different. Mm -hmm. Don't know if you guys have got any tasting notes, but I mean, what you're always really looking for for the, the shop shelf that we have, there's always a nice bit of wood spice there's always this kind of clean fruitiness to it. It's very, very vibrant. You know, there's always kind of florals, kind of uh, orange blossom. There's kind of peach. Um, there's usually something a bit jammy or kind of berry-like, some kind of summer fruit in there somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. 
it's so it's so fresh on the nose, but on the taste, you really get the the creaminess and the from the bourbon. So it's almost like so you know when you like a, a toffee apple at Halloween and it's like the sweetness mixed freshness at the same time. It's yeah, it's really nice. That, that's such a good tasting note. So this one is so that the last cast we've only just finished. My official tasting note for that. So if you ever get if you guys ever come to the distillery, we will only ever get the team to the tasting notes for these self fills. And I think we had about five of the, the team did tasting notes and it listed what they thought as a kind of one sentence thing. I can't remember if it was mine or Alex's actually. I think it might have been Alex's, was eating a toffee apple in a Dunnage warehouse, which is almost exactly <laughs> what you just said. <laughs> and obviously the same cast type, you're looking for a lot of similarities. But it is that, you know, it's that kind of really kind of sweet, but also vibrant fruitiness. Mm-hmm. But something a bit musky and kind of old going on as well, I guess. Gosh, I can't believe for Alex and I think. <laughs> I know what I do. My, mine was the the toffee apple in the back of Dunnage Warehouse. I think Alex's was eating a toffee apple walking through an orchard. There's lots of toffee apples flying about in the distillery yes. that day. It was, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if anyone at home has got any taste notes, it'd be fantastic to hear your thoughts. Uh, we mm-hmm. haven't done the, the team tasting notes for this one yet. And if anyone has any fantastic taste notes, I'd be more than happy to include them on the official um, point of sale for this cask. So, any good tasting notes, you might become famous and get a wee, uh, wee plaque next to the cask in the visitor centre. <laughs> nice. But it, is, <laughs> it is obviously a big whiskey, though, you know, cask ring, 52%. Um, what do you guys think? A couple of drops of water for this one? Tends to open up a little bit? Yeah. I prefer, I yeah, so. I prefer to yeah, get a bit of water in there. It's lovely. It's really lovely. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, I've, I've been very lucky. So I've been at the distillery here for six and a half years now. And we've always got casks of that kind of vintage, 2001, 2002. Uh, and for the long time, we had consecutive casks as well. And it's really interesting, you know, seeing how similar they are, but the, the difference that that cask makes. You know, I always talk about um, terroir and whiskey. A lot of people talk about where the barley's grown and, and all the rest. But for me, the terroir and whiskey is more about where the casks came from. You know, where did that tree grow? Um, how hot was it? How cold was it? How did they cut it down? How was it processed into a cask? And I think that's where that kind of difference really comes into whiskey. I, I realise I'm, I'm going wildly off piece and should probably try and keep things back uh, back on track. <laughs> I could talk for hours. Uh, where are we here? So we've got a few people, uh, with a few taste notes and things. Um, sweetness. Um, Got Patrick saying he's interested in the Japanese smooth. I definitely recommend uh, coming on site and trying that. We are the UK exclusive for the Japanese smooth. So it literally got released on the, the same day as the Olympics, the 23rd uh, of June. So definitely recommend coming on site to try that. And of course, uh, this whiskey as well. Um, but I think, you know, trying this, it's obvious why it's such a good base for a blender. The distiller was very much designed to be that kind of heart malt, that um, ingredient number one for, for a blend. It's, I always talk about when you're making a blend, obviously I'm not a blender, so Rianne, you can probably correct me on this. But it's almost like you're building a wall. You want to start off with a strong foundation and you're kind of building up that wall with the individual characters, the different malt whiskies, and then it's the green whiskey that kind of ties it all together. That's the, the mortar, the cement that kind of holds the wall in place. That is really all about that foundation, what you're starting with. Yeah, it is. And, and as you said, Aberfeldy is part of it. So, you know, when we're building these blends we are thinking of the Aberfeldy character and you know making sure that everything complements that so yeah completely right it's um if you don't have the good foundations then you're setting yourself a fail to start off so um, but yeah it's, it's just it's so lovely this one I, I'm, I'm biased as well because obviously I help cast but you know it's just the tropical notes and stuff that come through as well it's yeah if you're trying it at cast strength and adding some water it's just amazing how the, the notes change you know, and the different notes you pick mm. up. Yeah, I think I think that's the great thing about cast strength whiskeys. You, know, you add a little bit of water, it changes it. You add a little bit more, it changes it again. Um, so it's almost like a whole evening's entertainment from just one whiskey. <laughs> 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 um, now, if any of the guys at home who have a tasting pack love this whisky, anyone that just wants to try it, um, generally we don't have this one available for sale unless you're on site at the distillery. We do try and keep it that you have to be on site to actually get this one. Um, 
but when I first tried it, when I arrived on site, I was like, I want to use this on the Facebook Live because it is a beautiful whiskey. I want to talk about this. Um, and I have managed to persuade the team to put it up on our online shop, shop.juice.com, for the next three days. So if you do want to treat yourself, this one's £120, which for a whiskey that's, you know, kind of 19 years, roughly, a 2002 vintage, um, £120 is pretty good value, I would say. Um, it's on sale until midnight on Sunday. Um, until stocks last. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be plenty <laughs> left over. I've literally just opened the cast just now. Um, but like I was saying, it's a great base for blend. I think it, it, it's all down to how we do things on site here at the distillery. So I know John and the, the production team, um, they could certainly speed things up if they wanted to, but the way we do things at Aberfeld, it's a bit more kind of time taken to do things right to get the character that we want. And the main way to do that is we've got a longer fermentation on site at the distillery, a minimum of 72 hours. And we've got a very tall, narrow stills, which run incredibly slowly. So if you wanted, we could obviously speed this process up and drastically change the character of our Aberfeldian malt, which we don't want to do, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so by taking longer to do these processes, you know, this longer fermentation, the tall, narrow stills that we have, and the time we take to run the stills, we end up with this lovely, kind of fresh, clean, fruity style of whiskey that's got lots of sweetness and it forms a good base uh, for, for a blend. Um, so Jackie, obviously you're, you're holding up some of our awards earlier on. I think that's kind of a testament to, to Dewar's. Um, and with Dewar's, especially on site in our museum, we show off loads of the old and weird and wonderful uh, advertising things, a lot of which came from Tommy Dewar, but the quality of the whiskey has always been there. But, you know, you do need that kind of advertising kind of prowess that Tommy had to go along with the quality. You know, you can have the finest whiskeys in the world, but if no one's trying them, then you're not yeah. going to no one's going to have them so um definitely for, for everyone at home that's not came on site highly recommend come on site and seeing some of the the weird and wonderful antics uh, that we have and i know you've got a few more items to do a bit of a show and tell with us i can um, yep i, can I show think a maybe things. maybe just to keep us to some kind of time because i know we started a bit late and i can ramble on for hours and hours <laughs> what we'll maybe do is introduce our last whiskey and then we can finish off looking at some some archive items um, and it's another brand new whiskey. So three new whiskeys tonight for us here at the distillery. And it is our special anniversary blend. So like we've been saying all evening, we're 175 years old this year. Um, and Rianne on the call, um, under the watchful eye of, of Stephanie and the, the blend team, has created a fantastic blend just to celebrate uh, the occasion. So Rianne, as the, the inventor of our 175 blend, would you be able to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so... It was quite, the way we went about this was quite different. Yeah, as much as we would love it, we didn't have any whiskey that's 175 years old. <laughs> and anyone that says that they do have it is, is lying. So <laughs> we just, we, we had to rack our brains and what, what could we do, you know, to, to celebrate this? And um, someone in the team came up with the idea of using the anniversary date, um, so the date in May. So we trolled through our inventory and looked at every cask so we took a sample of every single cask that had the anniversary date um, back in May. We sampled everyone, knows every single one individually. And then just from there, we had to obviously just make the blend. And norm normally the way that you make a blend is you kind of have an idea of what you want it to be like. Whereas this one, it was free reign. Like, go with the samples that you like the best, see what happens. That didn't work. Try again. Was it, you know... And I think it maybe took about nine or ten iterations to get to this final one. Um, you know, for example, if you if you taste it, obviously there's like the slight hint of smoke and stuff in there. So even looking at the peat level, I think I made up two or three blends alone, just tasting the peat, reducing the peat, just to get that perfectly sweet balance. So for me, it was it was just such a pleasure to work on. Is it was just so different, so off the wall. So, you know, when do you ever get to create a blend from scratch? Um, so yeah, and I'm pretty proud of it. I think it's, I think it's pretty good. I think it does um, George proud. I think it's one for the history books, if I do say so myself. But yeah, I'm interested to see what everyone else thinks of it. So obviously, it's really the team that's tried it before. So yeah, I'll be interested to see what what the customers and stuff think as well. No, I, th I think you've honestly done a fantastic job. And I think, obviously, it must be amazing fun just creating a blend. You know, a lot of the time you're trying to replicate the same kind of flavour, but when you've got free reign of X amount of cast to create whatever you want, um, that must just be 
amazing. I'd be like a kid in a sweet shop. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, that's exactly what I was going to say. A kid in a sweet shop. That's what it was like. Yeah. Fantastic. But yeah, it's a, a fantastic blend. I think it obviously does have the classic kind of Jewish style. You know, there's lots of honey, citrus notes coming through there. Um, there's, it's quite a heavy whiskey. There's a lot of kind of older notes, kind of done. I always say Dunnage style. What I mean by that is, you know, when you walk into a Dunnage warehouse, it's kind of musky, it's kind of earthy and a bit damp. Yeah. But it's yeah, I would agree with that. It's, yeah, it's, it is slightly heavier, more complex, comparing it, in my opinion, to White Label. Um, I think that's what sets it um, different, you know, and it's, I think that just gives a nod to the, the range that we used. It was just a range of different types of malt. Um, different types of grains, different ages, different wood types. You know, there's several different wood types alone in it. Um, mm. So yeah, it was just you know pick and choose whatever you think works and whatever yeah, you think. It's, it's, yeah. it's fantastic. You know, I, I think it's absolutely beautiful. It's it's different to other Dewar's blends out there. Quite quite a bit different, but at the same time, it does fall in line with the house style, which is is kind of strange but wonderful at the same time. Yeah, how we still got that honey note and stuff to run through. Um, it's quite, yeah, impressive. That's fantastic. I think, you know, the story with it, I think, was really nice. You know, like you're saying, no one's got 175-year-old whiskey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I think, you know, selecting only casts that are filled on the 15th of, of May, you know, the anniversary date from when John opened the shop way back in 1846, is a fantastic idea. And that obviously kind of leads into the, the fact that this is a non-age statement whiskey. So Dewar's as a company, we are committed to age statements. So every single one of our whiskies, apart from White Label and now this, will have a number. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, it's, it's almost a, a contract. It's a guarantee of what's in the bottle. It gives you an idea of what to expect. Um, and I think, you know, certain whiskies, there's a good reason to not put a number on it. I think this is definitely one of them because... If we were to put a number on this, it just wouldn't do it justice, not only to the quality of it, but what's in here as well. It's a fantastic yeah. blend. Like I said, there's no need for an age statement when the whiskey is good, because at the end of the day, that's what's important. The whiskey is good. Yeah, exactly. We wanted the whiskey to do the talking, because if you if you said, oh, it's 10 years old, 20 years old, people get fixated in that age sometimes. So we want the whiskey to be the focal point. Um, and, you know, the packaging, the packaging on the bottle is beautiful and, um, you know, a nod to our history that way as well. So we wanted the bottle and the whiskey itself to be the talking point um, and people not to get distracted by other things. So Definitely. And I brought it here because we, uh, I've got my, my version here. <laughs> this is the bottle. It comes in a, a tissue wrap. It's got one of our old photos in the 1890s on it. And this is because historically our bottles were sold wrapped in tissue. They weren't sold in cartons until, well, probably our earliest cartons around about the 1930s onwards and even much later than that. So they were using like tissue wraps probably right up until the 1950s or 60s. Um, so it's nice. It's, I probably can't hear me now. It's actually a lovely wee bottle. Really quite nice. It is beautiful. It, it, John Dewar's signature from the archive right across the front, <laughs> which is nice. It's one of the things I love that, you know, it, it's although we're an innovative and forward thinking company, there's always that nod to the, the where we came from. You know, John's signature is on every bottle of Dewar's um, yeah. somewhere beyond the kind of cap or, or the label, wherever it might be. Um, if anyone doesn't any really tasting notes for this, it would be brilliant to hear them. Um, it's really exciting hearing people at the that still are, you know, trying this brand new blend and giving us tasting notes. Um, and I think it's that great balance between the kind of heavy muskiness, the kind of honey, the butterscotch, but also kind of there's lots of kind of light fresh fruits. I think that's something you always get with Dewar's, uh, lots of citrus, but but also lots of kind of apple and pear as well. Yeah. Um, it's just been a fantastic taste note from Barry. It's not for, for the 175 blend, but it's for the, the 2002 uh, self-fill cask. It almost tastes like someone has started making a rhubarb crumble. And when they turn the cookbook, um, they continue making a Christmas fruit cake. And then instead of using the oven to finish it off, they bung it into a peat fired oven. <laughs> that is wow. fantastic. That is <laughs> wonderful. I, I think for me, you know, tasting those, it's all about, you know, visualizing what it is. And I think that's a, a great example of a, a good tasting note. Um, lots of wonderful notes for the 2002 uh, cask. Um, Cameron's saying the 175 is perfect for a log fire and a wing back chair in winter. That's that's a kind of whiskey, yeah. you know. 
it's that kind of in, it's very indulgent I think you indulgent know, and, and comforting yeah Anna's tried it and she loved it she's got an unopened bottle in the in the collection fantastic good to hear that um Patrick's saying it's a bonfire night whiskey marshmallows candied nuts and spice uh, yeah it's fantastic it's absolutely beautiful I think you have for, for your first blend I believe Rihanna as well you've you've absolutely <laughs> out the park <laughs> where'd I you know, go I, was, <laughs> I know I was saying that to everyone I was so nervous it's my first one and um yeah obviously it's starting off my career and I want to do it justice so I'm glad yeah glad it's went down awesome awesome so guys if you do have any other taste notes please do stick them in the, the comment section or if you have any questions for either myself, Jackie or Rianne, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but Jackie, I realize we've asked you to bring lots of kind of items from the archive along for a bit of show and tell. Um, so we'll, we'll pass it over to you and if you can, you can show us what, what you've managed to smuggle out of the archive. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a right raid in the archive the other day. <laughs> People must, when they see me loading my car up with archive stuff, they must wonder what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so I've got a couple of bits and bobs I can share with you. One of them was that, as, as that example of how diverse our portfolio would have been historically. I thought I wanted to share some of our old labels. So we've seen, um, haven't we? Uh, have a look. Also, we used to have lots of different products, um, and it's quite interesting. So, for example, this one is one of my favourites. This one is fantastic. This is Old Highland Toddy Whiskey of John oh, and oh. So yeah, this is whiskey for making your toddy with, and it's extra strength according to the notes at the top of the label. <laughs> and I think that would have been clear that, you know, when you mix it with water, it's not going to be drowned out. I think it's very sensible. And it came with a recipe on the back of the bottle as well. So that's one of my favourites. So making, making a, selling a blend for a very specific use is, seems quite innovative to me, I think. Um, and another example um, of a of a, how whiskey used to be described, uh, here is our old liqueur whiskey label. Old oh, liqueur whiskey. And it was not a liqueur. So the word liqueur was often used historically to describe a very old whiskey. Um, and you can, when you think about old whiskies, like it does sometimes tend to be a bit more kind of syrupy, or, or maybe that's even just a mouthfeel thing. But I kind of get where they're coming from with that. I kind of understand that kind of link. Um, so, yeah, that's not unusual. Interesting. Do you think that'd be a liqueur as in because it's a blend, do you think? Or is it just in general for older whiskies they used to call it liqueur? It was for older whiskies because um, the majority of what we were selling, other than things like the Tully Met and, and a little bit of Aberfeldy, everything was a blend. So it was just yeah. one of the blends. So, yeah, yeah, it's interesting because it does confuse people. Uh, and you were talking about the advertising of Tommy Jews. So I also brought along... Um, a little old advertising example. So one of his innovations, oh, I'm just going to reach over and grab it. I think, you know, there's so many wonderful items uh, and stories from Tommy Dewar. I think <laughs> if you haven't heard of Tommy Dewar, by all, please do look into him because some of the stories are just utterly fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and, and he was a great believer in doing something innovative in the advertising so that the company would get talked about as well as it just being an advert that was out there. It was something worth getting column inches in newspapers about. He loved that, to, you know, to create debate. This one created debate. This was the largest mechanical sign in 1910, uh, 1910, 1910, there, but, uh, It's so big, I'll have to show you in two parts. There's a big Scotsman, here he is, called the Scotsman. <laughs> made out of light bulbs that was on the London Embankment. Um, and the lights flashed on and off to make it look like um, he was drinking, he was pouring his whiskey, he was drinking it, and Kilt made it look like it was kind of wafting in the wind. Um, so it was really an iconic brand at the time. It was, people loved it, people hated it, but they got a lot of column inches with them. Um, it was controversial. 68 feet high it was. <laughs> so you can imagine wow. if you were walking along the London Embankment. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, yeah, it was quite an eye catcher. One thousand four hundred yeah. light bulbs. <laughs> it got people talking though, so it Definitely. certainly did. One of the things I like about that story is um, at the time the Chancellor of the Exchequer was a guy called David Lloyd George, and it was actually him that kind of helped put in place a series of laws and kind of tax increase and things that you know it made it kind of harder for people that hold a whiskey and make whiskey and so on and so forth. Um, and 
the, the Highlander could be seen from the House of Parliament and literally every time you look out the window, you know, this guy in quite a prestigious seat of office looks outside, he's an ardent teetotaler, didn't drink whiskey and actively made it hard for people to drink whiskey. There's a giant Scotsman drinking whiskey. Fantastic. <laughs> So good. <laughs> I'm sure Tommy thought about that. I'm sure he did. <laughs> um, and we also had um, in 1930. This is actually this was put out just after Tommy had died, but it was. Um, I, I'm sure it's you know one of his ideas. Let's put it that way. It's a picture disc from 1930. Uh, whiskey with forefathers. I don't know if you can see that. But this was out in the day. I think I think it was Tommy introduced it to the day back in the 1890s, and then this was in 1930, and we're still using this. Idea. Wow. Actually, it's like a cardboard and you can take it if you have an old gramophone or a private or a mobile gramophone because you're obviously not going to go away. Um, but if you, you, if you look on YouTube, somebody has played it because that's how I know what's on it. Well, it says what's on it, but that's how I've listened to it. Um, if you kind of um, search on YouTube for like Dewar's gramophone record or something, it came up when I, I searched really kind of casually. Um, the, one of the songs is Doc and Doris, so you can search on the Dewar's Doc and Doris. And that's that kind of famous music call um, song about like one for the road or one for the door, just, you know, you have your last drink before you leave the pub at night. Um, and it's by, it says it's sung by Sandy McNabb, but that was a character of Sir Harry Lauder, the famous music hall oh, comedian, really? who was a friend of Tommy Dewar's. They were kind of good friends. Um, so yeah, so it's a fabulous little piece of our history, this one. These were, over a thousand of these were given out as gifts at Christmas in 1930 to the Scotch whiskey trade in Scotland. Oh, that's amazing. Nice. I absolutely love the Whiskey of Forefathers. It's such a, a brilliant concept for, a, for an yeah. advertising campaign. Obviously, we've got a lot of that stuff on site. So again, a little plug, you know, come and see us on site. We do have a clip um, from one of the originals that we show in our film. Uh, some Scotsmen dancing about, which I believe, Jackie, was believed to be the first motion picture advert for, for any drinks product. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, so, yeah, 1897, we had the first advert for a drink, a cinematic advert for a drinks product. I could say cinematic before cinema, really. <laughs> In the very early days of film, filming and advertising, yeah. And it was screened onto the roof of a building in New York. So it, it literally brought traffic to a stop. It was like, again, another Tommy Dewar, you know, you don't just advertise, you advertise and you, you like practically slap people around the face so that they notice. You make sure they know. You make sure they know. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it's, it's so many great stories. And, you know, I think, you know, he's known for his Jewisms as well. One of them that we have about the site is if you don't advertise, you fossilise. And I think that certainly seems like one of his mantras because he yeah. was just so busy all the time. Uh, very much also, life and you've got to understand that in the context of its time because not everyone thought that advertising was um, a respectable thing to do especially like in the 1890s when Tommy was really kicking off with a lot of the crazy stuff um, you know a lot of people were, did frown upon that kind of flamboyant in your face advertising um, but he obviously it, 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 <laughs> it did the job it worked. So. Yeah. It worked. we've got uh, Charlene saying Jackie always has such interesting items <laughs> So uh, I know I know Charlene's done quite a lot of her tastings, her and Stuart. Um, cool. Very dull whiskey club and all the rest of it. Oh, very good. <laughs> so, yeah, everyone loves all the items that, that Jackie shares. It's always oh, a good night with Jackie with all the, the fantastic stuff she's smuggled out of the, the Glasgow oh, I know. <laughs> I, do you know what? I get paid for this. It's, this is like as good as Rianne's job. We, we It's great. <laughs> We've got pretty good jobs, don't we? I like to think. Lovely. <laughs> if I yeah, all three of us really do the best jobs in the industry. <laughs> Fantastic. We've got Graham seeing his order bottle of the 175. So hopefully you get some to, to taste as well. Uh, and you, you enjoy it. When you do, let us know what you what you think. But um, you guys, I think we should probably kind of wrap things up because I realize despite starting 15 minutes late, we've still gone for almost an hour here. Um, <laughs> what we like, honestly. <laughs> There's so much to say. We knew we knew we could kind of condense 175 years and three whiskies into kind of 40 minutes but we thought we'd try our best <laughs> <laughs> uh, so guys if there is any final questions um please do uh, let us know and we'll do our best to answer and um, if anyone has any questions that we unfortunately don't manage to get to live we'll make sure everyone gets an answer at some point in the future i'll come back tomorrow and we'll make sure everyone gets an answer to any questions that, that you guys do have and um, it'd be great to know as well what everyone's favorite of the, the three was um, I imagine we'll have a lot of people saying the 2002 uh, single cast was a fear. There's a lot of tasting notes that came through for that one. Uh, and I have a set through those as well. And we'll, we'll see if anyone uh, gets a little name plaque in the, in the distillery next to the cast, <laughs> the, the tasting notes up there. 
Um, and as well as that, as a thank you for everyone for joining us, the discount code, like I mentioned, it is active as well. So if you use the discount code Jurors Live, all capital letters, all one word, you'll get 10% off. So I don't think we've got any more questions coming, guys. So I guess, you know, Jackie, Rianne, thank you so much um, for just blethering with me about all things Jurors and Aberfeldy for the last kind of hour or so. Um, it's always great fun just to talk about whiskey, uh, especially over a couple of drams. So I really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. <laughs> we'll do another Facebook Live next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and to everyone at home watching along, it's been fantastic having you. Um, and we'll hopefully see you at some point in the not too distant future, either on site or on another Facebook Live. But guys, I guess all that's left to say is thanks again and cheers. 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 Happy 175th. Happy 175th. <laughs> Get the next 175. <laughs> <laughs>